Um, and we're at uh, Gufa. So it's uh, about two, two thirds down the way, two thirds down the page. First one on the line is Shin Mem Shmamina. So we're continuing the discussion yesterday about somebody who needs atonement for a sin he committed intentionally, but it turns out it wasn't a sin. Goof, and and, and uh, went back and forth. And the, one of the points that Gamar raised was this idea of doing a mitzvah shaloy lishma, doing a mitzvah for the wrong reasons, for one's own vested interest. So the Gemara wants to go back to that original idea. Gufa, Amr of Yehuda, Amr Rav. Rav Yehuda says in the name of Rav, Lo'olam yasik adam b'tero b'mitzvahs, afilu shaloy lishma. A person should perform Torah and mitzvahs, even shaloy lishma, for the wrong reasons. Shemitesh shaloy lishma, b'alishma. Because if a person does the mitzvahs for the wrong reasons, eventually he'll come to do a mitzvahs for the right reasons. And he gives an example. A person should perform Torah and mitzvahs for the wrong reasons. a sacrifices. <clears throat> uh, he set up, I believe it was uh, um, uh, six, six different, six different. Uh, one second, the exact number here. Hold on. Sorry, in three places, in three places, he built seven altars. Right, it's twenty-one, and in each altar, he brought an aisle and a an aisle and a power, a ram and an ox. So forty-two sacrifices. Now, why did he bring the forty-two sacrifices? So that. Bilam should, should should get the spirit of God and be able to curse the Jewish people. So completely for the wrong reasons, he sacrificed. He's, he's bringing sacrifices, okay. But nevertheless, because he brought sacrifices to God and not to one of his other pagan idols, he he uh, he he merits uh, the the child to have a grandchild Rus. Rus. says Rus Eglin Rus was the grandchild of Eglon, the king of Maev. Now, Eglon, the king of, Ma Eglon, the king of Maev, lived significantly earlier than uh, the, to be. It, it was not possible for Eglon to be the grandfather of Rus. Mm. Eglon lived about two hundred years before Rus. Um, but it means he was Eglon was the ancestor, the patriarch of the family that Rus came from. Okay. And uh, Bolak was also the king of Maev. So presumably, Rus was a descendant from Bolak as well. Omer of Chibar Abba. Chibar Abba says, Omer of Yechon, the name of Yechonan, Minayin she'en HaKadosh Baruch Hu mekapech afilu schar sichano. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not cut off the reward, even for something very small, such as a nice way of talking, pleasant manner of speech. How do we know that? Because we find, you know, just, just talk about it outside first, we have the two daughters of light, right? And they, they name their children. First one names a child, Mayav. The second one names a child, Amin. What does Mayav mean? Mayav means Mayav. It's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty, um, ex exposed, an exposed, uh, exposed, expo yeah, exposing a dark story. That's the name. You're giving a child a name, but it, it, the child comes from the father. The second daughter was much more reticent about giving such a name. So she said, he, she said, my child's name should be Amin. He comes from Ami, the people. In other words, she wouldn't attribute who the who the paternal who the paternity was of the child to her father. So because of that, we find this difference. The Ilu Bechira, the Karisa Mayav, the the older child that called that called her her her, her son Mayav. Amr Rachmana, when the, when the Torah speaks of, of uh, doing battle with Mayav, it says, Al Totsar es Mayav, Al Tisker Don't place a siege on Mayav and don't do battle with it. Mohamma hu deloi, Avatsuritsarina. One is allowed to cause pain to Mayav. In other words, the. Um, in other words, war. So, so the Jewish people wanted to travel through Mayav's property to be able to fight, to be able to enter Israel. So God tells them, don't go to battle with them. Now, God did give them permission to, you know, 
deal deal with them in other political manners, you know, in in in, a, in any way that would cause them pain, that would be permitted as well. That would be permitted. However, the Elot's era, the younger the younger child, the Carissa Ben Ami, she didn't want to call the child, you know, for for her father. So she said, Ben Ami, it's from somebody in the nation. The name was Amin. Amarle, so God said about, about the children of Amin, Al Titsurem Valtiskarvam. Al Titsura means don't even cause them pain. Valtiskarvam, don't fight, don't fight with them. Al don't pressure them politically either. Okay, so what's interesting here though is that. In a certain way, we see that there is a greater um, the Torah is, is is finding greater appreciation with the younger daughters, uh, with the younger daughters' act because she wasn't as explicit in where her child came from, and that was a good thing. However, at the same time, it's also true that the older one, um, she thought she was. We said that we, we we said yesterday both of them thought they were doing a positive commandment. They were rehabilitating the world. They thought everything was being destroyed. So the, who is the first one to begin rehabilitating rehab, the world? The older daughter. And there's a certain greatness in that, that she went first. Amr of Kibar Rav and Amr of Shubin Karcha. Kibar Rav says the name of Shubin Karcha. L'olam yaktim adam advar mitzvah. A person should always be first to, to perform a commandment. Why? Shavizchar l'ay l'achas shakad m'bechir l'tzira. Since the older daughter went first, before the younger daughter. Zach savikad ma'arba deris b'yisrael l'malchus. So the descendants of Amin and Moav were both um, were both um, both both of them eventually were part of the Davidic dynasty. Dynasty. David's grandfather was descendant of Moav, right? That was um, Ivid was the daughter of um, Ivid was the daughter. So Rus converted. Rus is descendant of Moav. She she converts. She marries Boaz. They have a child, Ovid, right? Ovid's child is Yishai. Ovid's grandchild is David. Okay. However, David ended up marrying one of the descendants of Amon. And the child, um, I'm sorry. Shlomo ended up marrying one of the descendants of Amon. It's four generations later. And that child was Rechavam, and, and eventually he joined, you know, he became a king. But it was a difference of four four generations from when they converted. Rus converted four generations earlier than than the descendant of Amin. Not Rechavim's mother was Naama Hamaynas. Shlema married a woman named Naama. Okay. So we see here that there is something worthy about the the older child that she went first and she was willing to. Um, she she was willing to participate in in a in an ignoble activity, to 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 do what she thought was a positive was was a positive commandment. The strange how good comes after all these. Yeah, uh, it's very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, Mishnah. We saw this Mishnah previously. Let's see it again. Haisha Shenodra Benazo, the woman who who accepts to become an Azar, the Frisha Esvahemta. So after 30 days, presumably, if she did a stam nazirus, 30 days later, then what happens is she has to end her nazirus. How does she do it? Three karbonis. What are the three karbonis? A chatos, an oila, and a shlomim. Right? So what happens? She, sep she, she, she separates three animals. She prepares the animals. She's going to go to the temple and bring it. Bring it. Then her husband found out that she's a nazir. And Azira and her husband said no. The husband nullifies in Azira's. Okay. So the question is who who do the animals belong to? If the animals belong to him, so now he's obligated to provide animals for his wife, but it doesn't mean that his wife actually owns them. She doesn't. They're his animals, and he lets his wife bring them for sacrifices. Since they're his animals and they were sanctified for no reason, turns out she's not an Azir. So Tate Vitira they can go and join the, the flock. They are completely non-sanctified. And because it turns out their sanctification was a mistake. And she didn't actually own them to be able to sanctify them. Okay, what happens if they were her animals? Let's say they were her animals. So then we then the sanctification is valid because they were 
And what do you do with it? Sachatos, the korban chatos, Thomas. That one is killed. This is in general is the law. If you have a korban chatos that you cannot bring, you kill it. Unlike other animals that can't be brought, that you can wait around and let them develop a mum, a blemish, and then sell them and take the money and buy, you know, some other sacrifice. You kill it for the soul. No. 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 Kill it and, and just leave it in the fields. Sachat, this is Thomas. Oila to carve Oila. The Oila is brought as a carbon Oila. Shlomim, the carbon Shlomim to carve Shlomim. However, there's an interesting feature. A regular Shlomim, so you, you bring the Shlomim, the, the uh, sacrifice, half, some portion of it is brought, brought on the altar. Some portion of it goes to the Kahanim. The rest of it goes, goes to the one who brought the carbon. And it's eaten for two days and one night. So if you would bring a carbon today on Thursday, you can eat it today, tonight, Thursday night, and Friday. By Friday night, you'd have to complete the consumption. Otherwise, if it was not the consumption was not complete by Friday night, then the rest of the sacrifice would be burnt. Okay, one second. However, the carbon the, the, the shlomim of a nazar is a different, a different, a different law. It's eaten only for one day and one night. So if somebody was ending their naziris today, you can eat it today, Thursday, and tonight, Thursday night, but by but, but Friday morning, it would have to be completely consumed. Okay, so shlom to carb, shlom in a chalm, liyayim echad, it's eaten for one day, ve'enan to unim lechem, and it does not need bread. Okay, Another another component is that the carbon of a nozer, the shlom of a nozer, requires breads to be brought. Sturm Kabanis requires bread. Most famously, a carbon taida requires 40, 40 loaves of bread. A, a nozer also requires some bread, and, and that bread is lifted up as part of the sacrifice. However, this, this shlomim isn't really a, isn't really a nozer shlomim because the woman's naziris was nullified. But it gets the stringency that it can only be eaten for one day and one night. But, the, but you do not need to bring the, the loaves of bread. Okay, next line. Hayla Mois Stuman. Let's say she has money. She, in other words, she, she said she had a pile of money. She took $1,000. And she said, this $1,000 will be for my Nozer Corbanus. Okay, so at that point, she's $1,000. She can go to, you know, go to different stores and buy what she needs. To uh, to bring the carbon, to bring the, the three different carbonates. So the rule is, if she separated the money but didn't specify which one, which pile of money, to, which sacrifice, so then Yipul and Adav are the whole thing you use to buy regular carbonates, carbon oil, carbon shlom, and you bring it. What happens if you divided the thousand dollars into three piles, three hundred thirty dollars in each pile? So Moyes Mifurashim. The money is specified. Dmei chatos, the pile of money that goes to buy the chatos. Yelchuli aramelach, you dump it into the Dead Sea. Like we said, a chatos needs to be brought for a specific reason for a specific person. You cannot switch it between people, which means if you have a chatos that cannot be brought, it's either going to be killed or the money will be going into the Dead Sea. So if anyone wants to go dive into the Dead Sea, maybe you'll find a lot of uh, ancient coins. Okay. <clears throat> No, one second. Okay, Lynn and Villa Mylan. But uh, because one second. Okay. Now, now the bring the bringing of these coins to the Dead Sea is a rabbinical it's a, it's a rabbinical law, because we don't want you to get confused with a chatos, a chatos that cannot be brought. The sac if you have an animal that's dedicated as a chatos that can't be brought, it's killed. So therefore, the rabbi said the money that's dedicated to the chatos also should not be used. But technically speaking, biblically, you're allowed to use the money. So therefore, loy nenen, you shouldn't be using the money, but loy mayalen. But if you did use the money, you don't incur a penalty for what's called me'ilah. Me'ilah is misuse of hectic money. 
Okay. Dmei Ayla, the money of the carbon Ayla. So you view Ayla, you bring a voluntary Ayla offering, and because that money is sanctified, you could bring an Ayla. So therefore, misuse of that money constitutes Me'ila. And, and it's a prohibition that incurs a penalty of monetary penalty plus a carbon. Dmei Shlomim, the money that was dedicated to be the Shlomim, if you shlomim, you bring a carbon shlomim. The money that was supposed to be brought for shlomim, it gets the same din of shlomim like a nazir shlomim, which means it's only eaten for one day and one night, unlike a regular shlomim. And it, and and however, since it's not actually being brought for an, an authentic nazir, so therefore it doesn't require the breads that a typical that a typical nazir would would bring. Okay, says the Gemara. Mantano, who's the opinion? The Baal loy mishtabed law. One second. Okay, so there, there's a debate here to what extent the husband is obligated to provide for sacrifices of his wife. Rabbi Yehuda says, that he's not obligated. So this Rabbi Huda would, would work very well with our Mishnah. Therefore, there's a difference between her sacrifices and his sacrifices. Because if there is an obligation for him to provide her with sacrifices for whatever she needs, then in effect, um, then in effect, uh, his and her sacrifices are really the same thing. Because he's obligated to provide it to her. So Montana de Bala Mishtabla, who's the opinion that says the husband is not obligated to provide her with sacrifices? It's the opinion of the Rabbana and the rabbis, the Ira Bihuda. Inside that Rabbi Huda, if it's if it's opinion of Rabihuda, I might take the term Baeda, Hamishtabla. In other words, why is it that the sacrifices, if they if if she if she if her husband nullifies her Nazirus, then why is it that the sacrifices become chulan? They become regular they lose the sanctification rabbi um, i'm sorry uh can you please give me the page and line position again we're in 24a we're in the gemara four lines into the gemara first word line is be'eder and last three words the tanya we learn okay what does this mean if a Let's say a man is wealthy, okay, and his wife has to bring a korban. Let's say she's a, a, a nida, a zava, or a yeladis. So there's those types of korbanos are what we call olivier. It goes up and it goes down. If you're wealthy, you bring an axe. If you're a pauper, you can bring a bird. It's a lot cheaper. So Rabbi Huda says if the husband is wealthy, then the wife can't bring a bird. In other words, he's obligated to provide her with sacrifices according to his own means. And therefore, it can't tell it can't tell her if, if he's wealthy to go to go bring a bird. He's wealthy, he has to go bring an axe. Okay, how does Rabbi Huda know this? Because when a person, when a woman receives a ksuba as a receipt, well, I'm sorry, when a woman receives her ksuba, so so what happened was she got divorced. He provides her with a ksuba, like he committed to her when they got married. So she writes him a receipt, and the receipt says as follows: Any responsibility that you owe me. Is, is hereby forgiven. In other words, I've, I've completely collected all other responsibilities. What are these other responsibilities? So besides for Ksuba, there's other responsibilities he may he may have owed her. And she's certifying that that was all, all those responsibilities were paid. Obviously, the question is, what are those responsibilities? So according to Rabbi Huda, Rabbi Huda says those responsibilities are the sacrifices. If she has any out, outstanding sacrifices to bring, She's certifying that her husband has provided her with, with those animals. Clearly, Rabbi Huda holds that a husband's obligated to provide sacrifices for his wife. And therefore, what does it mean it's his or her sacrifice? They're really the same thing. Because she, he is obligated to provide her with you know, whatever level of sacrifice he, he, would, he would bring. Okay. So the Gemara is trying to prove that our mission is clearly is clearly the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda. Rava Amar, Rava says he's not convinced. Afilu Tamer Yehuda. 
in a, I'm sorry, our mission is clearly the Rabbonin, because the Rabbonin say that the husband is not obligated to provide sacrifices for his wife. However, uh, one second. Rava says it could even be the opinion of Yehuda. One second. Uh, Rabbi Yehuda holds that that what is he obligated to provide? Second, the the Rabbi Yehuda holds the husband is obligated to provide sacrifices. What type of sacrifices? Only sacrifices that she is actually obligated to bring. So, because in other words, she takes her husband's sacrifices to bring it to become to, because she's an Azar. Then it turns out her husband nullifies her in his ears; she doesn't have to bring them again. So it turns out that her husband was never obligated to provide her with a sacrifice in the first place. And therefore, it, while it's true that he is obligated, they're not her sacrifices. And that obligation doesn't exist in the case where she isn't, doesn't have to bring anything. And therefore, retroactively, she had never had a right to pull those sacrifices and they are not sanctified. They're chulen. Okay. Okay. Igadam ring, another version of the same Gemara, was, is exactly the opposite of the previous Gemara again. So the Gemara says the difference between her sacrifices and his sacrifices. It says the Gemara, Manta Igadam ring, uh, one second, one, two, six lines in the bottom of the page, new version of the Gemara, which is exactly the opposite of the previous version. Mantana, who is the author of our mission that differentiates between his ownership and her ownership? Amr of Chiz, Rav Chiz explains Rav Yehuda. It's obviously Rav Yehuda. And even though the husband is obligated to provide sacrifices for his wife, but that obligation is only is limited to and something that she's obligated to bring. But in something that she's not obligated to bring, like a, a nazir that her husband, a nazirus that her husband nullified, then she had no right to take her husband's her husband's uh, animals, and therefore the animals are not sanctified. To e rabbanon, because if the opinion is the opinion of the rabbanon, he's not obligated to provide her with any with any sacrifices. One second. Okay, so so in other words, according to the Rabbanon, the husband was never obligated to provide her with sacrifices in the first place. So she can't take her husband's sacrifices. So the Gemara says, okay, fine. So you're right. In the case of Naziris, she had no right to take her husband's animals. But there are many different sacrifices a woman, a woman would have to bring, right? And how exactly is it ever possible for a woman to bring her own sacrifice? In other words, how does it become hers? What right does she have to bring a sacrifice if it belongs to her husband? What's the scenario where she is allowed to bring a car bonus? Where the husband gave it to her, and once it's once it's hers, it's hers. Okay, which means that by the way, if the woman was a real Nazar and her husband knew about it and decided not to not to invalidate it, not to invalidate it. Then indeed he would he would provide her with sacrifices. He would actually give it gift it to her. Okay. So therefore, our Mishnah can't be the Rabbanon's opinion. Rav Amar, Rav says it could still be the Rabbanon's opinion. What happened here? He let's say he said something like, at some point during their marriage, he 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 gives her a gift. Whenever you need a sacrifice, you can have it. It's yours. Okay, so now she needs a sacrifice. She's a nozer. She needs to bring three. So she takes three. She has full permission to take three sacrifices. But now it turns out she doesn't need to bring a sacrifice. So says Rava, the only reason why the husband gave her, gave her the gift was so that she could bring a sacrifice when she needs it. Now that she doesn't need it because her husband nullified her naziris, in effect, the gift is invalid. The gift is invalid. It was never hers to sanctify. It wasn't hers to sanctify. The animal could be a chulin and it could even be according to the Rabbanon. Rava, I feel the term Rabbanon. It could even be the rabbi's opinion. Law, when he provides her with sacrifices, 
either on a fixed basis, you know, because she's she's a zava nidi aladis, or for Naziris, and, and he and he doesn't know, or he does know, and he's about to nullify it. But that gift, the milsa the tzrichel, is only when she needs to bring the sacrifices. The milsa the light tzrichel alloy making law. But if she doesn't need to bring it because, um, because her husband nullifies it, so then he does not give he, the gift is not valid. Okay, im shaloh haisa haisa If the animal belongs to her. So then the chatas, the chatas we kill, the oila is brought as an oila, the shlom is brought like the shlom of a nazar. So the Gemara says it's her, it belongs to her, he, Minola, had it in the world as a woman, does a woman get a carbon? Ha'amr, don't, don't, didn't we learn? Mashikonsa isha kanabailo. What a woman acquires belongs to her husband. So Amr Papa, Papa says, Shemakatsasa me isasa. Like we learned, if anyone remembers in Subis, there are certain obligations the husband is, is obligated to provide to the woman, and he's obligated to provide to provide for her a certain measurement of food. Let's say there's extra. So if there's extra food, she can go ahead and sell it and keep the money. Tysus is not so sure about how what you know what type of extras it could be. There are different types of different allowances. The, the, some of the extras she's allowed to keep, some of the extras not. But regardless. The extras that she's allowed to keep, she she said she she was stingy with it until eventually she saved up, she sold it, and she got money. Ibai Zayim, another possibility. The Akni Laachar, somebody else gave her a gift. The Amar and and he said to her, I'm giving you a gift on condition that your husband does not acquire this. And in that case, a woman can acquire without her husband. Okay, we'll start the next tomorrow. Ha'ayla to carve. Ayla v'ashlam to carve shlam. The ayla is brought as a carve. Ayla the shlam is brought as a shlam. But we said the unique feature of a shlam that was previously sanctified to be in his, to be to be for a nazar is that it gets the same laws of a nazar. What does that mean? One day, one night, instead of the regular shlam, which is two days, one night, and it also, but but different than a regular shlam. Different. I'm sorry. Different than a shlam of a nazar because a shlam of a nazar requires the breads to be brought along with it. And the shlomim of that was supposed to be for Nazar but isn't does not require these breads. And we have four similar situations, four similar scenarios, which the Gemara will go through. Shmuel says to Avua, the son of Yi, don't sit down on your knees. Until you explain to me the following, the following statement. Okay. And this is it. Now. There are different versions that had to interpret this text, the, the, this, pre, this previous line. I'll explain it as follows. He had a question for him. Okay. The question is, I'll, let's, let's, let's continue. I'll, I'll, I'll go through the question before we get to the specifics. The question only comes all the way at the end, after all the specifics have been enumerated. So he says to him as follows Don't sit down until you explain to me the following. There are four examples of a carbon aisle, a shlomim. That is a ram, a male sheep of, of a carbon shlom for an aziras that does not bring the bread. And what are these four examples? Shaloi, his, shaloi, hers, shaloi, misa, after, after he dies, and after his, his sin has been forgiven. Okay. So the Gemara will explain each example of what of the, uh, each example of one, uh, a shlom that was, that, that was supposed to be brought for a nazir, which does not require bread. And the conclusion of the question is, isn't there one more? And that question will go be all the way at the end of the Gemara. So he's telling him, here's the four examples. And don't sit down until you answer th this question. The question is, isn't there one more? And before he had a chance to say, isn't there one more? He went ahead and specified all four specific cases of a, of a shlomim that does not get, does not bring a shlomim of a nazir, does not bring the breads. Obviously, one example we've seen already, that would be shalah, kurs that her husband nullified. So she, she separated a shlom of an azar her husband, from her own animals. Her husband nullified her naziris. That shlom does not require breads. That's one example. Okay, let's go see the other, the other three. Okay, shaloi, his. What, what does that mean? The time we learned, to ish madras b'nai b'n azar. A man can make his son into an azar, his younger son. The ain isha as benob an azar, but a but a a woman cannot make make her son into an azar. However, there's an interesting feature. 
If a man makes a son into an Azar, the son has the ability to reject the Naziris once he becomes an adult. How does he do that? Gilach, he shaved his head, he cut his hair. Or some other relative cut his hair. Micha, he publicly protested. Or some other relatives protested. Okay, so now he's no longer an Azar. Problem is, is that he had money that was set aside to bring carbonis. Then all those are brought as voluntary sacrifices. Mifurashim, but if the money was specified, the mechat, that's the money of the chatas, Yachu Yamamalach goes to the Dead Sea. The me oila, you view oila, they bring an oila. Umayla behen, and it's it's a regular oila. You, you, if you misuse it, you you have, you have the penalty of me'ila. The me shlomim, the, the money of the shlom, you view shlomim. You bring shlomim. However, it is the same laws as our mission. If an echol only game echad, ve'en and to unim lachem. Um, it's eaten for one day and it does not require the breads. So the, this is an example of shalai. The example of shalai was our Mishnah. She brought, she, she appears to sacrifice, her husband nullifies her Naziris. Next example, shalai achar misa, behold. What exactly is that scenario? The Tanya we learn, hamafresh mois a nazirusai. A guy commits to bring the carbones to end his Naziris. You can't benefit from this money, but you can also you also are not moil in it. You can't misuse it. Because you could bring a shlomim, and a shlomim is considered it's not going. It's a lower status of of of, of sanctification than than an oil and chavos. Okay, mace. Let's say he dies. And he had money that was set aside for sacrifices, but not not specificated. That money is all, all bring you, you take it and you bring regular gifts, regular sacrifices. Mois mit for Russian. Let's say it was specified. The, the money of the Chatas offering goes to the Dead Sea. You can't benefit from it, but you also can't misuse it. The Ayla is a regular Ayla, therefore you can misuse it. The money of the shlom, you bring a shlom, and it's eaten like the laws of a nazir shlomim. One day, one night. It does not require breads. Okay. After he, he already received his atonement, in other words, let's say he, he, he meant to, he, he set aside a carbon to bring his sacrifice. And what happened was, um, he he lost it, so he sets aside a shlomim. He loses the shlomim. He brings another one, and then he finds it. So it, he's already received his kapara. So what does he do? He brings the shlomim. It has the same laws of nazir. You can only eat, eat it for one day, but you do not need to bring the breads. Okay, and the Gemara says that the la'achar kapara after he was he, he received his atonement svaru. It's it's logical. It's just like after somebody dies. Once once the nozer dies and it, before he brought his carbonis, so then why don't you bring his sacrifices? Because you can't you can't atone from it. After the, after he's already received his atonement because he's brought other sacrifices, so he can't atone for himself a second time, and therefore it's logical that it has the same laws of of la'achamisa. So again, four examples of carbon that does not, a, a, a shlomim of a nazir that does not bring breads. A woman whose naziris was invalidated, a, a, a boy whose father made him a nazir and he later rejected the nazir after his carbonis were separated. A guy who was a nazir ended his naziris, was about to bring the sacrifices, but then died. Somebody who was supposed to bring his sacrifices, but he lost one of the animals. And then he found it after he already, after he already brought a different animal in its stead. Okay, four examples. Now the question is, Vesulai, Vesuleka, is there isn't there another example? Vaeka, there's a, there's a fifth one. Vesha'ar kol shalmi nazar, shashak and shaloika mitzvah sam ksherem, le'un le'bayal m'shem chayva. Let's say when they were bringing the sacrifices of, of a of a nazar, the kayan does not have in mind to bring it for this specific nazar. He has in mind to bring it for a different nazar. One second. Okay, so he, he has a mind to bring it for a different nazir. What's the story? 
So the, the sacrifice is kosher, but the, the Nazar needs to bring another shloman. Now, and, and this shloman that was brought, since it was originally a Nazar shloman, even though it was brought for it was brought for a different reason. In other words, he thought it was somebody else's shloman. Only for one day. Does not the bread? You don't bring the breads with it, and the zroya, the 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 arm of the of the animal, the front the front leg, is not. There's typically a procedure how that's eaten, and that's not done because it was brought for the wrong person. So evidently, there's a fifth example of a carbon of an ozer that is not that does not bring breads. So so why is that not listed in in, in the group of four? So the Gemara says, we're, not, we're talking about where there weren't where there wasn't a mistake. The four examples are scenarios where there was no mistake, something happened that ended in a zeros. Whereas this price is a mistake, where the guy thought the shloman belonged to somebody who wasn't a Nazar and brought it with the intention of that person receiving receiving the atonement. So therefore, that, that's why it's not listed amongst the group of four Kurbanis. Okay. See you tomorrow. Oh, Great night.